Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to talk today. This is very exciting. And I'm here to tell you about um, the diagnostic assay that we've developed in the Wong Laboratory at Brandeis. And we didn't do this alone. We had several collaborators, um, including Barry Kreisworth and his team at PHRI, um, Francis Dubernowski and his team at the Blizzard Institute, and Rob Warren in South Africa. And this project was initially funded by Smith's Detection Diagnostics. So what did we do? We actually wanted to look at um, multidrug resistant tuberculosis, and not only that what um, drugs confer resistance and their specific gene targets, but we wanted to look at the exact mutations. We wanted to be able to see exactly what mutations were causing this. And we wanted to do this all in a single tube. So these are the gene targets that we looked at and their corresponding drugs. And we have first and second line drugs here. And so how did we do this? Well, I want you to remember that all of this is occurring in a single tube. And to do this, we used late PCR. And what late PCR is, is it's a form of regular PCR, but it produces single-stranded amplicons. And this is important because it um, improves our detection sensitivity, which is very important for things like tuberculosis. It also separates amplification from detection, and this allows us to probe at any temperature range. And this is really important for our next technology, which is called lights-on, lights-off probes. And so what are lights-on, lights-off probes? Well, we have an on probe that has a fluorophore and a quencher, and an off probe that just has a quencher. In our single, in our single tube, we have these on and off probes, and we have our single-stranded target. So what does this data look like? So the on probe binds as a function of temperature to your single-stranded target. And here you see the fluorescence. This is the rate of change because it is a first derivative, so you see it increasing. Now, as the temperature is decreasing, the off probe binds next to your on probe, and you see a rate of change of decrease of fluorescence here. So for drug resistance, we're going to be looking at mutations. So what if there's a mutation under one of these probes? For example, here, I have depicted a mutation under the on probe. This will shift the signal lower in temperature space because you need a lower temperature for this probe to bind. And then you'll subsequently have the off probe binding. This will give you a different signature than your reference. And this is a constant occurrence. So back to our multidrug resistant assay. So we looked at eight particular gene targets. And to do this, we needed 16 primers and 21 probes. Now, this is a lot of material in a single tube. So what does this look like? So this is our single tube multiplex design. And we have four channels for a regular PCR machine across temperature space. So in each of these channels, we have different gene targets. In the FAM channel, we have the RRS904 to 908 region, the RRS512, and the RRS1401. What's important to notice here is that the colored boxes represent on probes, and the darker colored boxes represent off probes. So as you will notice, across the FAM channel, you can have multiple probes. That's because it's differentiated by temperature space. So looking at the next channel, we have gyrase A and CAT G. In Cal Red, we have gyrase B, EMBB, and INAJ. And in Quasar, we have RPOB. Okay. So what does a reference signal look like? So coming out of a single tube, I'm going to show you the data. So this is what comes out of a single tube. And these are replicates of three in the first derivative in the background of a large amount of human genomic DNA. So you have your four channels, FAM, Cal Orange, Cal Red, and Quasar. And the machine reads the different colors, and, but it's all in the same tube. And this is your reference strain. So this is what a reference signature for RRS would look like for the CAT G and gyrase A, for the INHA and EMBB, and in Quasar, the whole thing is RPOB. OK, so now we want to look at mutations. So here is the RPOB in the Quasar channel. And here is just a representative set of the mutations that you can see in RPOB that would confer drug resistance. And this is 
frequencies. And again, you want to note that the off probes are in the dark and the on probes are in the colored. And as you can see, you have a long line of on and off probes here. And we want to make sure that not only can you differentiate all these mutations from your reference strain, but also from each other. So I'm going to look in particular at the histidine 526. And in histidine 526, this is the reference signature here. And the nucleotides are CAC. And we're going to look in particular at that first position. So you can have multiple nucleotides there. So you could have an A. And as you can see, the A there confers a different um, signature than your reference, as does the G and as does the T. So you can see here that they all are different from the reference strain and they're different from each other, which is great. Okay, but we had to put multiple targets in a single color because of the fact that we were restricted by only four colors. So we had, for example, in the Cal Red channel, we had INHA and we had EMBB. In the INHA, we were looking at the promoting mutations and an EMBB. And here, we're looking at um, mutations both under the on and the off. And we want to make sure that we can see if there's a mutation in both, if there's a mutation in one, if there's a mutation in the other, and if there's no mutation. So we're going to look particularly at these mutations. So here is a reference signature for INHA and EMBB, again, over temperature space. And now what if there's a double mutant? You have a mutation in INHA and you have a mutation in EMBB. It is clearly different than your reference signature. And then if you have a mutation only under EMBB, but it is referenced in INHA, it is again different from both the double mutant and the reference strain. And what if the converse is true? So you have a mutation under INHA, but it is referenced in EMBB. You want to make sure that would be a different signature, and it is. So in this single tube multiplex, and going back to the full design here, what does it look like if there's multiple mutations? So here we have a strain that has three mutations. There's a mutation in CAD-G, EMBB, and RPOB. And it is reference or wild type in FAM, the RRS-904, RRS-512, and the RRS-1401. And it is reference in gyrase A and INHA. What would this data look like? And you can see here that in the FAM channel, as expected, the blue are the reference strains and the red is the test strain. So here you can see the blue and the red are matching, and this is for the RRS. All three RRS amplicons are being detected in this channel. And these, again, are replicates of three, and this is the first derivative in the background of human genomic DNA. So in Cal Orange, you see there's a deviation from the blue and the red, and that is because of the mutation that I previously stated in the cat G. Again, you can see a deviation from the red and the blue, and that is because of a mutation in the EMBB. And in Quasar, you see the deviation because of the mutation in RPOB. Okay, so I ran 30 different strains twice in our lab, and I looked at just deviation from the reference strain. And every time there, well, I scored it correctly, every time there was a deviation in the reference strain, it did match with the sequence data. And I got 26 out of the 30 strains deviated in RPOB, 13 for EMBB, 6 for INHA, 10 for gyrase A, 22 for cat G, and 8 for RRS. And the mutation numbers, some of the strains had one mutation, Four of the strains were wild type, and some of the strains had up to six mutations. So that was very interesting. And I compared this against available sequence data from PHRI, and it was in complete correspondence. Okay, so future directions. This assay is um, able to be expanded. We can add more targets. There's available temperature space, and with the um, addition of machines with added colors. We can add lots more things, which would be very exciting. Um, there's been other verification studies. The people um, at Francis Dubronowski's lab took this assay and ran it on 237 strains, and they tested it against the line probe assay there, and it again turned out exactly as expected. 
And actually, Rob Warren will be taking this assay to South Africa to be testing it on thousands of different strains. And in the future, we would like to have an automated mathematical resolution for these curves so that you don't have to actually look at it and see if it is different from the reference strain. You would just have a math equation to tell you that. And we've started that work, actually, in our lab now. And that's, that's it. So that was a beautiful talk. Um, I actually have a question for you and Rob, because um, Rob alluded to the difference between genotype and phenotype, and whether or not that's going to become, whether there is going to be kind of systematic discordances between genotype and phenotype, or whether genotype and genotype, the information provided by genotype is really the most robust clinical information, and that's where we should go diagnostically. Um, Rob, do you want to? <laughs> go ahead. I, I think at the moment that we would go for um, a genotypic definition, but we would have to be able to um, qualify the result with a phenotypic result in, in the future. And then we would be able to, I think, define an algorithm how to use the, the the particular diagnostic assay. We see this, as I think, with the line probe assay, that some um, strains will have an RPOB mutation according to the absence of perhaps a wild-type probe, but they are rifampicin susceptible. So I think those things have to be ironed out with time to, to build an algorithm. I'll just be now. What is the detection limit? Okay, so if it depends on, on exactly what you're, you're asking. So if you're asking, are you for like mixtures or for, for mixtures, it's down to 10%. We can confidently say 10%. It could be lower, but I'm going to say 10% to you. <laughs> And, and for NTMs, you can, you can detect down to five in, in a presence of background of NTM, so it depends on. Yeah. How does this assay deal if you have pumps? If, that, if you have pumps that render the organism refractory to drug in the presence of a sequence in your colors that shows no difference? So you, would, I, I, you would have a resistant organism without a genotypic change. Could you detect that? If there was no mutate, there was no point mutation, markers, yes. then we wouldn't be able to detect it now. Is the sensitivity good enough that you could do this directly on clinical specimens, or do you need culture? Um, it's going to be tested on clinical. Specimens. I have not tested it on. Um, have you thought about parazinamide in this system, as in where a larger portion of the gene needs to be interrogated as opposed to just a, a few hotspots on the gene? Yes, pyrazinamide, you, you could do pyrazinamide. Um, I don't know if you would, this, this assay is great, it's very flexible. You could if, say, you didn't want to look at RRS, you could take that out and put in pyrazinamide in its own color there. Or you could um, have a whole separate assay for pyrazinamide and have them run next to each other. Um, because pyrazinamide, as you said, is, is such a large gene. Um, and you would want to coat the whole region with probes. So um, you could definitely use this technology to do that, yes. But this assay currently does not have that. <laughs> 